Okay, so today, David and I, David Anzalone and I, we're going to be presenting you with a debate on divine love, the doctrine of hell, and the possibility of universal salvation. Uh, so I am a lecturer uh, here at Lucerne in philosophy and theology, and, and David is one of our doctoral students. What we were trying to do is we want to showcase some of the lively debates that are happening in the Lucerne program. And so this is just one of many interesting things that we're doing. So the topic today, uh, can a loving God send people to hell? Personally, I find myself uncertain what to believe exactly about this topic, but what I'm going to do today is I'm going to offer a negative answer to our debate question. I'm going to say that no one will go to hell forever. I'm going to argue for universal salvation or the view that eventually everyone will get to heaven. And I'm going to do this in two steps. So first, I need to just explain what divine love is. And then second, I'm going to argue that the different alternative doctrines of hell either deviate from divine love or they fail to offer an ultimate defeat of evil. So the only view that does not deviate from love and that provides a clear defeat of evil is going to be universal salvation. So step one, we need to just define divine love. So the topic of divine love, it is a surprisingly controversial topic in theology. Personally, I don't think it should be uh, controversial, but I know too much about the history of Western philosophical theology to say that it is uncontroversial. So some classical theists, they argue that God is not loving and that God's goodness is not moral goodness. Now, I find such views deeply implausible because I think they just run counter to any major revealed religion. Other classical theists, they disagree and they say that God is loving. However, they assert that all of God's love is self-love. God only loves himself, and in some sort of convoluted way, you might be able to metaphorically say that God loves you. So this notion that God's love is purely self-love, it is utterly rejected by other models of God, like neoclassical theism, open theism, and in a lot of panentheists. So these other models of God say that love is deeply important to a proper analysis of divine goodness and the claim that God deeply cares about his creatures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow the lead of a neoclassical theist named Jordan Wesling. So Jordan, he has developed something called the value account of love. And so Wesling tells us that love involves a trio of values. So what is love? Well, love involves valuing a person's existence and flourishing, but also involves valuing a person's uh, or friendship with that person. So valuing a person's existence, flourishing, and friendship. So when God loves someone, God deems it worthy that this person exists. He sees the value in that person existing. When God loves someone, God deems it worth pursuing the flourishing of that person. Why? Well, because God sees the value of that person flourishing. And then when God loves someone, God deems it worth pursuing a friendship with that person. Why? Well, because God sees the value of friendship with that person. And I think this connects really nice with a solid account of God's omniscience, goodness, and perfect rationality. So it's perfectly rational. God's going to be appropriately responsive to reasons. And considerations of value are one kind of reason to be responsive to. God will always act for objectively good reasons to further his purposes. And it's perfectly good. God will always do what he has most objective reason to do. And he's going to exhibit the most virtuous character when doing so. Now, as omniscient, God will know what all of the objective values are that are worth responding to. So on, on Wesling's analysis of love, human persons have great value. Well, since God is omniscient, God's going to know that human persons have great value. And it's perfectly good and rational. God is going to be appropriately responsive to the value of human persons. And I think this analysis of divine love, it also fits nicely with the claim that God cares about his creatures. God sees that you have value, and he deems you to be worthy of his attention and worthy of his action. And in philosophy of emotion, that's what we call caring or concern. If you care about something, you will be disposed to pay attention to it and act on its behalf. So God is, is one who cares deeply for his creation, and he will most certainly pay attention to his creatures and act on their behalf. Okay, now we come to step two. So we need to look at the four, there's going to be four different doctrines of hell that I want to look at. So these four doctrines of hell, they are called eternal conscious torment, possible escape, 
annihilationism, and universalism. Now, those are the four doctrines of hell I'm going to take you through, but I also need to give you a way of assessing each of these doctrines so you can try to figure out why you should think they're true or false. So thus far, I'm saying, premise one, the value count of divine love is true. I'm saying that. What I'm, what I'm going to do is ask you to consider different views on hell. And so you need a criteria. You need some criteria by which you can judge these different views. Here's one that I suggest to, to evaluate these different theories on hell. And so this is premise two. If a view on hell entails a divergence from one or more of the three values of love, then that is a sufficient reason to reject that view. Now, let me add a third uh, assumption that I think a lot of Christians and, and, and other um, and Jews and, and Muslims will probably also want to embrace. Premise three, one day God will ultimately defeat evil. So why should you affirm three? Well, uh, if you're a Christian, you might go, well, there's this thing called Revelation 20 through 22. The Bible right there clearly says that God's going to ultimately defeat evil. Uh, a second reason you might want to affirm this is that you think, well, I think that a perfectly good God must punish wickedness and bring about ultimate justice. If there is no ultimate justice, there is no God. So with these assumptions, we can begin our exploration of different notions of hell. And so here's the first inference I want to make uh, from these three assumptions. So this leads me to infer premise four. If God lets the damned carry on sinning forever in hell, then God will not ultimately defeat evil. Now, I take uh, premise four to be obviously true. There cannot be an ultimate defeat of evil if there are just a bunch of damned people in hell who just continually engage in sinful rebellion against God. If that sin continues on forever and ever, God did not do a very good job at defeating evil. So a Christian cannot coherently say, you know, God has ultimately defeated evil. Well, except for all those people in hell over there who just continue to sin forever. You know, that's not a de defeat of evil. That just makes no sense. So this leads me to infer uh, something else. So given three and four, I infer premise five. God does not let the damned carry on sinning forever in hell. Now, once we get to premise five, this is where we're going to reach an impasse. God does not let the damned carry on uh, sinning forever in hell because God will ultimately defeat evil. But here's a question. How is God going to pull that off? And so here are some options. So the first option is eternal conscious torment. This is our first theory of hell to consider. And so eternal conscious torment says that God ultimately defeats evil by sending the damned to face eternal conscious torment. So on this view, the damned suffer eternal conscious torment and they have no chance of relief. So the suffering of the damned, it's not for their own good. It's not for their own flourishing. Also, the damned, they have no chance of entering into a right and loving relationship with God. The damned are sent to hell precisely to prevent their flourishing and precisely to prevent their friendship with God. So on this view, the damned can no longer sin. They can no longer engage in these sort of free activities. Their, their fate is eternally sealed, and they are no longer able to rebel or repent. They can do nothing but bear their just punishment for all of eternity. And so on, according to the eternal conscious torment view, that is how evil is ultimately defeated by God. So eternal conscious torment, it gives us this really clear defeat of evil, but you might be worried that it diverges from divine love and the divergence. It's not difficult to see because on this view of hell, the damned are prevented from flourishing and prevented from having friendship with God. And so that's going to be a divergence from two of the three values of love. And remember, any divergence from divine love, that provides you with a reason to reject that theory of hell. So given this, one has sufficient grounds to reject this view of hell. So what we need to do is we need to look elsewhere to find a view where God can ultimately defeat evil without diverging from love. So here is another option. This is called possible escape. So God sends people to hell in order to punish them, but in such a way that the damned have the opportunity to repent reform and enter into heaven. So this is the view that Jordan Wesling affirms. You see other people like C.S. Lewis affirm this in various writings. So on this view, the damned are punished, but their fate is not eternally sealed. There is opportunity to escape hell, but only if you repent and reform. So this view is consistent with the three values of love. So God values the damned's existence because he keeps them going. And then God also values their flourishing and friendship since he keeps providing them with opportunities to repent and reform. 
However, the problem is that the possible escape view, it does not off, it doesn't seem to be consistent with an ultimate defeat of evil. Because on this view of hell, the damned have the option to repent and rebel forever and ever. The reason anyone stays in hell is because they continue to reject God. So the damned can potentially go on sinning forever by refusing to repent and reform. So even in hell, humans can continue to sin, which is why there is no clear defeat of evil. And that is a problem. So we need to consider another view. Annihilationism. Okay, so annihilationism says that God ultimately defeats evil by eradicating the damned from existence. There's different versions of this, uh, of this view. So on some versions of annihilationism, God just eradicates an unrepentant sinner as soon as they die. So as soon as they die, that's it. They're over. Other views will say God sends a damned person to hell for a little while, um, and there's, but there's no chance of escape. So they stay there for a little while so they can receive punishment and really be clear that, okay, I'm being punished by God, and then they're eradicated from existence. And then there's another version of annihilationism where the damned are sent to hell for a while, but they are given the choice of annihilation or repentance. Now, I don't think that this is going to be a good option since annihilationism conflicts with the value account of love. So notice that in annihilationism, it is a more extreme divergence than eternal conscious torment. So in annihilationism, there is divergence from all three values of love. So first, God cannot be said to value the existence of a person if God eradicates her from existence. And then second, God cannot be said to value the flourishing of a person if God eradicates her from existence. Because after all, a person cannot flourish if she does not exist. And then third, God cannot be said to value friendship with a person if God eradicates her from existence. You don't usually put people in the friend zone by eradicating them. You know, like I gather that God, if he's going to annihilate you from existence, he's just not that into you. So we need to look elsewhere to see how God can ultimately defeat evil without diverging from divine love. And this brings me to the final view. This is universalism. So universal salvation says God ultimately defeats evil by bringing everyone to salvation. So universalism does seem like the most obvious way for God to ultimately defeat evil at this point in the argument. On most accounts of universalism, there are people who go to hell for a while. They're sent to hell until they repent and reform. But the claim from the universalist is that everyone will eventually repent and reform, and then they will eventually enter into heaven. So the human denizens of heaven, they will have freely cultivated a virtuous character such that it is no longer possible for them to sin. Hence, one day God will ultimately defeat evil. So this account of universalism, it's consistent with all three values of love, and it provides a clear ultimate defeat of evil. So none of the other views have been able to do that. So I conclude that universalism is the most reasonable option to affirm. Can, God send it, can a loving God send people to hell? No, not forever. The everlasting God is patient enough to wait for everyone to eventually repent, reform, and enter into friendship with God. There we go. Now I'm going to hand things over to David Anzalone to give us a counter uh, a view to this. But uh, we need somebody to unmute David. Yes. <laughs> yes. Now, can you hear me, everyone? Yes, perfect. Okay, I'll just share the screen. Let's see. Okay. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah, looks good. Okay, great. And it moves, right? Yes. Yeah, sorry. You're moving. So yeah, you're going. I'm moving. My name is David Anzalone. I am a doctoral student of the University of Lucerne, as we said, and I'm actually all the time discussing with Ryan about hell. Uh, every time we talk, it's always about hell. I don't know why. I don't know what it is with Ryan, but anyway. So can a loving God send someone to hell? I will argue that yes, a loving God can, note the can, send someone to hell. So I will, first of all, affirm the value account of divine love. So in this case, we're arguing from the same assumption. And so the criteria that Ryan uses to um, argue against some the other versions of the doctrine of hell is the same as my criteria. And I will argue that a loving God can send someone to hell. 
This means that I deny the doctrine of universal salvation, at least in one of its forms, and I argue that hell is a real possibility. Uh, we'll say a little more about that. So I will take you to a journey. We will leave Ryan's universalism, going closer to a traditional, a more traditional, let's say, doctrine of hell, passing through a possible escape theory. So we will leave heaven to go to hell. Not like Dante who, who left hell to go to heaven. Now we will leave heaven to go to hell. So first of all, just a historical note. We are not new in debating uh, these issues and not at all new in Lucerne. One of the most important defenses of hopeful universalism, that is to say a version of a possible escape theory, is that of Hans Urs von Balthasar. Von Balthasar was a Swiss theologian from Lucerne who wrote a few books, for example, There We Hope That All Men Shall Be Saved, Short Discourse on Hell, and Apocatastasis. That's, these are his famous writings on the subject. And here's a little picture that I took of his grave. So if in, you're in Lucerne and you want to visit the grave, just shoot me a message and I will tell you where it is. Everybody always call, calls me to know where von Balthasar is. Now, what did von Balthasar believe? He believed that, sorry, universalism was something we could hope for. So he would say, we don't know if everybody will go to heaven. Universalism. We don't know if universalism is true, but we can hope. We can hope that all men shall be saved. We cannot know that everyone will be redeemed, but maybe it is the case. But this entails that hell is still a real possibility. Think of someone very evil. It might be the case that that person at the end of the day will never be redeemed. That is the view that von Balthasar. Um, advocates for, especially because of free will, because we have the possibility to always reject God, according to von Balthasar. So he was not a universalist. Now, this being said, this will be useful for later. Um, let's start with some distinctions regarding universalism. Um, there are different versions of universalism. First of all, there's necessary universalism. According to necessary universalism, there is no possible world, using possible words machinery, in which someone could end up in hell. That is to say that universal salvation is necessary. So think of a possible world as a possible way in which things could have gone. There is no alternative possibility. Everybody will necessarily go to heaven, according to uh, necessary universalism. So more formal, we say universal salvation is true in all possible worlds. There is no alternative to universal salvation. We're all going to heaven. And even if we didn't exist and there was another version of the world, everybody would go to heaven. According to contingent universalism, universal salvation is contingent. Okay. This means that salvation is true in some possible worlds and some versions of the story. It could have gone otherwise, but it's true in some versions of the story. And we are fortunate because we happen to live in that side of the story in which we all go to heaven. So even though we could have been more harsher, God could have been more harsher. Um, maybe he could have created more intelligent beings, less intelligent beings. The rational beings at least will go to heaven. So universal salvation is necessary, is, um, is contingent, but it happens in our actual world. So universal salvation is true in some possible worlds and especially in the actual world. Then there is what I, I'm, I called hopeful universalism. Hopeful universalism says something very simple. Universal salvation is true in some possible worlds, but the rest is mystery. What does that mean? It means that, again, we can hope that we are on the safe side of the story. We can hope that um, God is in a certain way. We are in a certain way. We will accept uh, God's offer. Everybody will accept God's uh, offer. But maybe we're not in that version of the story. Maybe we're in that version of the story in which at least someone 
at least one person ends up in hell. And in this case, universal salvation would be false. So what is Ryan affirming tonight, um, at least in this argument? He's affirming contingent universalism, I believe. Why? Because of the value account of divine love, which certainly cannot entail necessary universalism because it wants to give a, a, a broader account of free will, I believe. And we will talk about that in a minute. And because of God's ultimate defeat of evil, right? So m the question I will ask Ryan and ask, uh, uh, which will enable me to analyze his answer is how does Ryan know that we are on the safe side of the story? How does Ryan know that we are in the actual world in which universal salvation is true. So how do you know, Ryan? How do you know? So um, first of all, let's talk about libertarian freedom. So Ryan didn't mention that a lot, but if you read Westling's book, uh, you find out that libertarian freedom is quite important for the divine uh, the value account of divine love, I'm sorry. But wh what is libertarian freedom? It's a simple analysis of human action in which we say that the agent could have done otherwise than what she does, right? That is the, the main core, the core of libertarian freedom. So if God values friendship and union with us, then it makes sense that he gives us room to accept or deny his offer. It makes room for us to be able to say, well, I don't really want to be friends with you. Forced friendship, coerced friendship is not friendship. So if God respects our freedom, I think um, I think he gives us room to accept or refuse this offer. Brian says we will be freely uh, reformed so that freely we will accept this offer. Um, I'm not sure we can say that. The problem is we don't really know that this will happen since libertarian freedom, if taken seriously, enables us still to refuse um, God's friendship. So I think he, he should give us a, a stronger argument on how libertarian freedom is compatible with contingent universalism. There are some arguments out there, but I think he could give us a stronger argument for that. So at the end of the story, maybe everyone will go to heaven, but we just can't be sure. So we cannot affirm contingent universalism, what Ryan called universalism to cool. So Ryan is talking about things he just doesn't know about. So second point, God's ultimate defeat of evil. Now, there are two reasons to affirm God's ultimate defeat of evil. There is scripture, in particular, Revelations 20 to 22. We will just give a, a little outlook on that. And the ultimate fulfillment of perfect justice. So if these two points pass the test, Ryan is safe and we all are safe because we're all going to heaven, right? So what we will do is to analyze them one by one. Let's start with B, perfect justice. So Ryan says, I think that a perfectly good God must punish wickedness and bring about ultimate justice. If there is no ultimate justice, there is no God. I'm not sure this helps Ryan case himself said that he himself said that there is a clear defeat of evil of evil, even in eternal conscious torment. So what he's saying is that God inflicting punishment in eternal conscious torment, a torment is enough to affirm perfect justice, the fulfillment of perfect justice. So I think that um, this is not helping. And so this is not enough of a reason to affirm contingent universalism. Second point, the first, is scripture. So Ryan here has the last ace up his sleeve. You know, he's American, he's a cowboy. So he he's always has the last cards. But there's a problem here because I think that Though I, I obviously believe in scripture and what, what is said, especially if you're Christian, I think, again, this could be quoted into context. So the context of Revelations 2022, 20, uh, the context of God's, of, of uh, the, the revelator saying that God will wipe away every tear, will, uh, there will be no more death, nor mourning, no crying, 
nor pain, because everything, all of that has passed away, is a, is a bit different than what, what Ryan says. Because it seems to me that the revelator is restricting that experience to the blessed. Because just after that, he says, this will not be the case for the faithless, the detestable, the murderers, etc. For them, there's the lake of fire. So it's true that, again, it doesn't say whether the lake of fire is eternal. It doesn't say whether you cannot go back into the city. Uh, the, the doors actually are never shut. That's what it says after. But at least it still restricts the ultimate defeat of evil. And in, in the way Ryan put it, in the, for the blessed. So it means that only the blessed will experience that um, new Jerusalem in which there, is, there will be no more uh, crying, mourning, and pain. So again, this is not enough of a reason to affirm contingent universalism. So I think Ryan didn't give me enough reason to affirm contingent universalism. I think we should fear him who can destroy both soul and body into hell. And we can and should hope he does not. So if the talk were to end here, I promise it's just a few minutes left, but the view I have defended is that we can hope that the damned will eventually all repent. So universal salvation, salvation in the sense of contingent universalism is false, but hopeful universalism in this sense is true. Now, let me ask a last more skeptical question. So we have assumed that hell is a form of punishment and a form of redemptive communicative punishment. At the same time, we said that uh, sinners are free to repent, right? Um, but if we put more emphasis on, on, sorry, on libertarian freedom on the side on the creatures, so we're not saying really God punishes, but we're saying that people just don't want to accept God's offer, then maybe there might be a point of no return. There might be a point in which um, the refusal of God's grace is final. If not in this life, I think it might be already in this life. Maybe some have more opportunities than other, others to accept God's punishment, uh, God's, sorry, God's offer of grace. Maybe in the next life, at a certain point, yes, God loves his creatures. Yes, he values their existence and flourishing. He values union with them. But at a certain point, he just might let go of them. He just might say, just do what you please. Just like a lover might let go of the beloved if she desires not to come back. And the parent might let go of their child if she decides not to come back. There's, it's not rational for God to pursue someone who will never come back. So, yes, hell is locked from the inside, as C.S. Lewis would say. But that doesn't mean that if we lock ourselves out of paradise, we will not be able to throw away the keys so to speak, and just, just say we will never go into God's presence and locking us definitely out of his presence. So we should fear, conclusion, him who can destroy both soul and body in hell, but actually which we should fear ourselves, the ultimate masters of our faith. Because there are only two kinds of people in the end, those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there could be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek, find. To those who knock, it is opened. Thank you so much. Uh, just keep the conversation going. Um, stay in touch with us. So um, shoot us an email to me or to Ryan. Go on our respective websites. And also stay in touch with the online Masters in Philosophy theology and religions, which will be presented in a minute. Thank you so much.